Good morning. Um, I'm just going to jump right into this since we are a little um, behind and tell you this morning a little bit more about our Rocky Mountain National Park Air Quality Initiative and um, how we've been working with the agricultural industry and others um, on this issue. So I'm going to give you a little background, a little history about the initiative and um, tell you about the approach that we are using, which is called the Nitrogen Deposition Reduction Plan, what eggs um, efforts have been in related to this, and some of those lessons that we have been learning and next steps. So in way of background and history, um, we really are dealing with three air quality issues up in Rocky Mountain National Park, visibility, regional haze, and increasing nitrogen deposition. Um, this kind of began back in 2004 when the U.S. Department of Interior and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency received a petition from um, Trout Unlimited and um, Environmental Defense Fund that said there are adverse impacts taking place in Rocky Mountain National Park to ecosystems due to these type of um, air quality issues. What are you guys going to do about it? Um, so shortly after that, the National Park Service came to our department, which is the State Environmental, um, Environmental Department of Environmental Policy, or what are we? We are the Department of Public Health and Environment, how soon we forget. Um, and they brought with them 20 plus years of data, plus about 80 peer-reviewed studies to say, yes, we are having impacts to our ecosystems, and um, what are you going to do about it? So we decided to kind of band together those three agencies, the Park Service, um, EPA, Region 8 staff, and our department, and formed what we called a Memorandum of Understanding between the agencies, or MOU, um, so that we said we will work together on this issue. Shortly after that, we started taking a look at what's out there. And we knew from our department that we had two um, things already in motion, and that was our state implementation plans for ozone and for visibility, or for regional haze and for ozone. And those plans are, are focused on sources of VOCs, of nitrogen, oxides of nitrogen, or NOx, um, and ozone, to say, OK, you sources, um, let's put some controls in place to try to reduce emissions um, for, for ozone and regional haze. So we had that, we knew, already in the makings. Um, what we didn't have were any regulations on ammonia. So, um, and we heard a lot from stakeholders that we needed to do something about this. So we decided, let's try a voluntary approach. And that mechanism is the Nitrogen Deposition Reduction Plan. It was developed by the MOU agencies and stakeholders to um, you know, set in, in motion some strategies to address nitrogen deposition. Um, this, and it was endorsed, actually this, I don't know what I was thinking, it actually was endorsed by the Colorado Air, Air Quality Control Commission, um, which they are the body that makes our regulations, air quality regulations in Colorado. So this plan, it's a 25-year plan. It has five-year milestones. Um, that go out to 2032, and um, it uses what is called a resource management approach. Um, so we have determined what that baseline conditions for a nitrogen deposition, what that was in the park um, in 2000-2004, and that was, as you heard earlier, about 3.1 um, kilograms per hectare per year of, of deposition that was occurring. And that is that 2.7 pounds of um, nitrogen per acre per year. Very small amount, but again, sensitive ecosystems. Um, and what we're trying to get down to is a 1.5 kilogram threshold, because that's what, what the Park Service is re referring to as the critical load, or that level where ecosystems are not being impacted um, as much by nitrogen. So for those who are more visual, it, this glide path, they're calling it, looks sort of like this, um, where we're starting at 3.1, and we want to get down to 1.5 in 25 years. Um, and right now, we're probably sitting right around 3. Um, 
And as you can see, we've already eaten up that first five-year period, uh, the first milestone, and we're likely not going to achieve that target of 2.7 for 2012. Um, but we don't know yet. We're still waiting for the monitoring data. It'll, it, it has a lag period of about six months, six months. So probably in about June or so, they'll have the results. Um, but we're probably going to miss that target. And so we'll talk a little bit more about what will happen. But some of those significant aspects of the plan is that the plan does identify those significant sources of nitrogen and ammonia. As Jay mentioned, that it, it is um, an issue that's not just a livestock or a fertilizer issue. There are other sources. Um, it'll use an adaptive management approach. So if new technologies, new information come out, comes out, becomes available, the plan can be changed. We don't have to wait for a certain period of time. You know, it can be changed, adapted. It's voluntary. It has no mandatory, you know, requirements right now. And it includes a bunch of strategies to, you know, try to voluntarily reduce emissions. And, um, and again, it taps into some of those other plans. And um, it includes a contingency plan. So the contingency plan is a, is a separate plan that was developed to say, what if we don't make those milestones? What happens? Um, so we'll be going through that process. We've actually started it already because um, we'll be using what, what is called a weight of evidence approach. We'll be taking a look at the air quality monitoring data, um, all the strategies in the plan, what agriculture has in the works for um, research and, and best management practices. Um, what reductions we anticipate from the regional haze and, and ozone SIPs. Um, so to, to say, do we need to start going down a regulatory path right now, or can we continue on a little bit longer? Um, here are some of our nitrogen sources. Um, the largest source is on-road mobile sources, uh, followed by um, our point sources, you know, coal fire, fire, fire power plants, um, other industrial sources, which fortunately we don't have a whole lot here in Colorado, um, and also some off-road mobile sources. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of where some of those NOx type of emissions are coming from. And again, this data is from my agency, from the Air Pollution Control Division. Um, a, a rather dated emissions inventory, but um, one we're using right now. So what are some of those efforts related to NOx? Um, again, we're, we're anticipating reductions from ozone and regional haze, cleaner burning fuels. Um, some of those are federal mandates that are coming down to clean up diesel, um, other, other cleaner fuels, uh, new tailpipe standards for car, you know, for what's coming out of the tailpipes of cars, oil and gas, um, controls on flares and tanks and other engines that they use, um, off-road engines, and stationary um, source emissions. So hopefully by 2018, which you'll notice is after that first milestone, uh, we, they do anticipate some reductions in NOx um, from all of those type of controls in the order of around 37%. And um, probably the biggest one we've had in the past two years, two, three years, three coal-fired power plants closed down. Um, and we also have two online to close down here in the coming year. So that, as, as some natural gas turbines replace those um, and new plants come online, we should see some good reductions there, um, as well as the vehicle standards and engine standards. You saw this slide earlier that Jay presented. Again, this is from our department, and it, it is another 12-year-old inventory that showed at, at the time the emissions were taken, about a 40% um, contribution from livestock and about 20 or so from um, the application of commercial fertilizers. Uh, also, there's, was, there's estimated to be some emissions from landfills and um, water treatment plants and mobile sources as well. Some other. So what are some of those reduction efforts? They're focusing primarily for agriculture on best management practices. And uh, again, for livestock operations and cropping, um, crop production. Um, we're also 
looking into the wastewater you know, treatment plants. Uh, we, we've been concerned because there's been some nitrogen stripping that has come online um, where treatment plants are being asked to volatilize and, and strip ammonia. Um, and that just goes up into the air. Uh, so we're, we're trying to understand that chemistry there and, and what is happen happening. Uh, we also have some concerns about domestic application of fertilizers to lawns, to municipal parks, to golf courses, uh, you know, where we all know a little bit is great and a little bit will make it greener than the neighbors. So um, uh, that's another area of concern as well as we have a lot of biosolids that are applied here in Colorado. Um, even some biosolids coming out as far as um, the East Coast that get applied out here in Colorado. So the, the ag industry, um, they have been very active in this issue. They are probably, well, I would say they're the only stakeholders that are actively engaged in this conversation. Um, and in 2006, a committee was formed of, um, of a diverse group of producers and, and trade groups. And the goal was to bring Ag's voice to this issue and to be proactive with addressing the issue. They didn't want regulatory uh, mandates. And, but they also want decisions that are made based on science um, and not some estimates and guesstimates. So here's an idea of who is participating in the subcommittee. Um, again, we see both the livestock and the crop producers. We have wheat growers, corn growers. We have the Colorado Livestock Association, Farm Bureau, uh, Farmers Union. We also have environmental defense, although we seem to have lost that person here lately. Um, you would think the environmental groups would be a little more interested, but I think right now they're focused a lot on oil and gas and fracking and, and some other concerns. Um, our swine producers are, are paying close attention to this issue and participate, as well as a number of federal and other state agencies, our Department of Ag, NRCS, um, and of course EPA. So what are some of those achievements to date? Um, the committee has pushed for keeping this on a voluntary path and using BMPs to um, help reduce emissions. And they also, they wrote the chapters to the nitrogen deposition plan and to the contingency plan for agriculture, which was really good um, because there was a lot of education that um, the industry has done for, to the Park Service and to others to say, you know, the, the picture and the story is not quite as, as you guys think. Um, they had no idea how industry, how, you know, agriculture works. Um, in general, so they have learned quite a bit. The group has also continued to push for concerns over the emission inventories, over methodologies and emission factors that are being used, over um, the data, the data sets that are being used, over the sources, you know, are all of the ammonia sources be correctly identified? Are they all included? Because it becomes very important when, you know, should they get to regulation and we start slicing and dicing, um, who needs to do what, um, you know, the more accurate the pie, the more equitable the process will be. So that becomes very important. Um, and I think one thing that Jay hit on that I, I think, you know, we're tracking closely are the number of wildfires that we have had here in Colorado over the past number of years. Um, we've had had some pretty good banner years and, and, and probably impacts from those huge plumes as well as the dropping of slurry um, that has been used because what is slurry? It's largely nitrogen um, and that's being dropped right on top of the ground and running off and volatilizing and, and moving around, getting blown around. So a lot of things that we still need to look into. Uh, the subcommittee has also done a real good job of, of talking to CSU to say this is important to us and, and CSU has responded by saying um, going out and getting a lot of grants um, to support research uh, that you heard from, from Jay earlier. Uh, we also have the attention of NRCS and they are working with us as well to try to um, help us address this issue. The committee has held like four symposiums. We've gone around to different parts of Colorado to try to do some outreach, educate other producers in other parts of the state um, about the issue and to try to share with them what they could do. 
um, to help reduce emissions or to at least stay tuned to what might be coming out. Um, and we've done a lot of presentations, also created a fact sheet um, that kind of summarizes the issue. So um, the biggest piece is the documentation piece. You know, we've been documenting what we've been doing for this committee, but I think we need to take that a step further, and we'll get to that. So some of the lessons learned, you heard Jay mention some of these, the seasonality of this issue, especially for agriculture. We see those contributions coming primarily, these big pulses in the spring and in the fall. So maybe we need some seasonal management practices. We don't need something you know, out there for these folks to do on a daily basis necessarily. Um, they have enough record keeping and other requirements because of the regulatory, you know, the, the Clean Water Act requirements and, and other state regulations that they probably don't need some additional things to do. Um, and in, we've also talked about the early warning system. Again, that's the meteorological system that um, Jay talked about. Uh, again, focusing that on the spring and fall. So um, we're going to be doing more with that. Um, there have been some lessons that we were learning through um, other CSU research um, that Dr. Archibek has been involved with with animal nutrition, um, but we, you know, it's those unknown things. It's, you know, and growth and hormone, hormone and, and um, other implants. Uh, there's some costs associated with that. Is that something that um, producers will pay for? Um, we also have those societal concerns from other, from environmental groups, um, animal protection groups, those type of things as well. Um, we do know that more research is needed. And um, so what, because as Jay also mentioned, we know that most of those emissions, um, or most BMPs have focused on water quality, water quantity type of issues. They have not focused as much on um, air quality emissions. So what is happening when a, when a manure mound is, is broke open, when compost is being turned, when land application is happening? Uh, what type of emissions are we, are we seeing? So some of the next steps for this subcommittee um, include, you know, continuing with our voluntary reductions, trying to get those proven and cost-effective BMPs out there and, and implemented by producers. Um, we also want to pilot the early warning system. We have about $140,000 right now um, cobbled together from a, a number of different sources to get a pilot running, so we want to test. How long um, are these upslope events? How often are they? Will producers participate in um, a pilot and curtail their activities for some period of time? And uh, a lot of good ideas around that system. And then we, we also though, will need to measure you know, what's the impact, if, if any. Did we keep um, emissions out of the park? That's you know, the challenge. Incentives. As I mentioned, we're working with NRCS. Um, they have committed to put, uh, allow for or to support an ammonia nitrogen air quality initiative, or at least we think they were before sequestration. We're not sure right now what, what, what the status of that is. We were kind of all ready to go with it, um, of, of kind of targeting some counties due east of, of the park um, to allow them an opportunity to get some ammonia, nitrogen, air quality type of BMPs on the grounds, cost share through EQIP. Um, but you know, we're not sure where that is right now. And um, the other important thing is we need a broader stakeholder involvement. Um, as I mentioned, ag is at the table, but where are the municipalities? Where are um, some of the other green industries? Um, you know, sod growers, greenhouses, others that use fertilizer. We need to pull them, cast our net, probably a little larger. Um, we as the state, we as MOU agencies. Uh, research, you know, we, we need more research. You keep hearing this one, um, but it is important. What are those ammonia-based BMPs? Um, if they get BMPs in place, what type of emission reductions are we finding? We need that type of quantification. Uh, we need improved inventories, ammonia inventory in particular. Uh, we also need some increased partnerships because those partners bring resources. They bring, you know, project ideas um, out there to try to, to get things implemented. And we need documentation. Um, 
so we have, as I mentioned, the early documentation of kind of what our successes have been as a subcommittee. But now we kind of need to take that to like an ag certainty type framework, something where producers get some credit, they get acknowledgement from regulatory agencies that they are doing something um, proactively in advance of, of, of a regulatory mandate. Um, they get that type of credit. So should people start talking about regulations, you know, maybe they, they get that credit and they don't have regulations right away. They have, you know, five years, ten years more to continue to um, do their regulation or do their voluntary BMPs. Um, so that ag certainty piece could be quite important. A few concluding remarks is that, you know, this is a long-term issue. We've been dealing with it for, you know, six plus years. Um, we're going to continue on for a long time. Um, we know at least 2032, probably longer than that. Um, but the, the conversations, the actions of the subcommittee are shaping the dialogue, shaping the decisions, and they are very important. Um, but there's also a lot of other pressures on agriculture. We need to be thinking about that. Uh, we need to be thinking of holistic solutions. We have nutrients. We have greenhouse gases. We have potentially ozone if they tighten those standards. Um, regional haze if, if, you know, we can't, if the, the state implementation plan we have doesn't work. So how can we be thinking of these things together instead of in the silos that we usually work in? And um, again, we need to build some certainty into the voluntary efforts of um, the department. So any questions? Uh, yes, sir. Only in freshwater uh, systems, phosphorus is limiting primary productivity, and I was wondering in your lakes and rivers if it's phosphorus or nitrogen uh, limiting the primary productivity. Um, you know, phosphorus uh, yeah. uh, is, is reducing nitrogen input is going to help. You know, I'm not uh, I'm not the, the water quality expert, so I can't answer that. But I know from the the environmental ag program world that I work in, we deal with nitrogen. We're nitrogen limited here in Colorado, um, so that's what we focus on primarily. Um, now, whether that's the situation up in the park, I don't know. So I I can't answer that question yeah, well. Maybe ecologists have pretty well established that tonight. The thing that the response that they're seeing, especially in the aquatic diatoms and things like that, is a nitrogen response primarily. And the Forest Service can't come up with a better thing to put out fire than <laughs> You'll have to ask them that question. I, mean, I work for USDA too. I mean, it seems like they know that what's limiting you know, primary productivity. That's the last thing. You I, I think it, when they're in the heat of the battle of a forest fire, they're not thinking about that. Mm. Is there another question? I've often wondered uh, if there's any link between this excess fertilization of the terrestrial environment related to nitrogen. Is there any link between that and forest fires? Do you know of any investigations? I, I think that there are researchers within um, the what the Colorado Atmospheric Group that are starting to take a look at that. Um, I, I think they believe there are some links, but they just don't quite have enough information yet, so they are looking at that, and, and I think um, the challenges we're facing at the park will kind of push for the need for additional information on that, especially with the wildfires that we have had here recently, including fires right in the park. So I think we'll get there. One last question. Uh, just one question. Um, it's a it's a very good question. The the BMPs include we took we started with NRCS's air quality BMPs that they have, and the subcommittee reviewed all of those um, BMPs. And in Colorado, what they've done is they they scored them for reductions of VOCs, of NOx, of greenhouse gases, of ozone, of, of a number of different things. 
So we reviewed this list, which was quite lengthy, and we tried to identify which ones you know, we either knew or believed would have some ammonia reductions. We added that to the table um, and included some of those in that list. Um, so it's the regular conservation practices um, that NRCS has already identified. And, and then we did add some more, um, which you know, are, even, are being kind of tested or um, considered by NRCS as ammonia um, type of reductions. 